And I've got someone I really like with me, Susan Pettifer, who's in charge in the city of Sydney of performance, people and technology and was head of HR in many big organizations. But interestingly, she co-wrote a book, which I think is a fantastic book called New Women, New Men, New Economy, which showed how creativity, diversity, openness and equity helps all sorts of things, particularly thriving in the new economy. Mm. But under her leadership, the city of Sydney achieved uh, in 2019 the Australian Award for um, workplace diversity and inclusion. So, hello, Susan. Right, Hi, Charles. Now, yeah, my first question to you is, <laughs> you know, a big focus of yours is about fairness and equity. And you've said something which I thought was really interesting. I'm just quoting you. It is like poison and you cannot achieve a good, responsive and even innovative workplace without fairness and equity. Can you spell that out a bit, please? Yeah, I'm happy to. Look, I think a lot of organisations, when they are talking about creativity and innovation, they go to diversity or they go to collaboration or something like that. But what I've learned over the years is that um, fairness and equity and a, a feeling that people are not disadvantaged is really, really critical to drive creativity and innovation. And it's, you know, its absence, yeah, is a bit like working on contaminated land, like it's a hygiene <laughs> factor. Um, yeah. And, and if you just don't have it, you just can't thrive. And, and there's a real science to that as well. So um, the psychological literature and the neuroscience says that um, positive emotion, being in a positive emotional state, um, leads to enhanced creative thinking and creative problem solving, right? And um, feeling a lack of, um, of fairness and equity, you know, feeling disadvantaged or victimised in some way is a really strong negative emotion. So, um, you, you just can't work from a place of creativity from working from a position of feeling like you're disadvantaged or things are unfair. And if we just, even if we don't think about that science, if we just think about it, if I don't feel like you're being fair to me, I'm not going to be fair to you, which means I'm not going to bring that um, extra effort, that discretionary effort that we talk about. I'm not going to bring my best ideas. I'm not going to bring all my talents because why should I? you know, if you're not being fair back to me. So, yeah, that's, that's why we focus on it so strongly. Yeah, no, no, I can feel it as you're even speaking. You sort of close in when there's no <laughs> fairness. I can just feel it coming across the airways. Mm. But w what I found really interesting is, you, you know, so much of what you're talking about in an organisation, a big organisation, is about the nitty gritty of getting things mm. done. Like, who mm. gets the car parking slot? Who's got the view from the window? All of those things. And you yeah. used that phrase. I loved it. Relentless implementation. Um, do you think it's really about that? So that so many small things ultimately embed the change? I do. I, it, you know, it sounds a bit, doesn't sound really sexy, does it, to talk about things like car parks and um, and over who gets overtime and who gets to take the the ute home on the weekend if you're a blue collar worker or who gets um, first in line for a new laptop or do you get an iPhone or do you just get an ordinary phone? But in public sector organisations, they're the sorts of things that really matter. You know, we're not talking about big bonuses. Um, and I think if you don't pay attention to those little things, that that those things can either be used to privilege people or they can be used to punish or victimise or disadvantage people, then you're just, you know, things like fairness, equity, they're just words on a page, you know. Um, so, yeah, you do have to do that relentless implementation to make it no, real. No, how do you make that? How do you make those decisions then? <laughs> In the old way, it was just whoever was the boss got the ute. How do you do it now? You make it very transparent. And of course, you know, City of Sydney, we're a public facing organisation. So uh, where is everything directed? 
public benefit, public benefit. That's our principle. If it doesn't serve a public benefit, well, you know, if it serves a private benefit, then it's yeah, yeah. not really meeting our principles. So we have a really clear idea of, of, of how we make decisions. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I mean, the other thing I also found uh, very good is the way you develop this tracking system, who goes and gets uh, MBA training, who goes mm -hmm. to the conference, all, all of mm. these things, which are not necessarily perks, but the things about mm. making more out of yourself. Uh, mm. Is that part of something you also discussed about new workplace standards? Or is that something different? Describe that a bit for me. Yeah, again, it's sort of like this sort of attention to detail, walking the talk. Um, and uh, I think I was describing it when we were talking about our gender pay parity work, which I'm very proud of. Um, and, um, you know, okay, you can measure what men and women get paid and you can see whether there's inequity in that. Um, but that's just for the present people. Then you've got to start looking at the pipeline. So who gets promoted? you know, um, and you've got to analyse that against men and women and different cultural backgrounds and different, you know, lenses. And then before you even get promoted, who gets access to do the executive MBA? You know, who gets access to... It's, it's really having a sort of consistent idea of, of what leads some people to be advantaged and some people not to be advantaged in organisations that that we pay attention to um, and you know we we think that works <laughs> yeah well it, it's really interesting because it the, the way it feels from what you're saying is there's mm. this sort of 360 degree perspective where all lenses are looked at simultaneously and I can see that, that that's where this relentless implementation thing really or <laughs> relentless thinking about the detail comes in I mean, yeah. one of the things... I don't uh, want to sound within... too big brother about that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're not a big brother. Uh, you're my big sister. <laughs> but uh, what's interesting, I, I heard in the news, you told me about the news that uh, uh, in Sydney, the city of Sydney, uh, it's uh, women get paid on average more than men. How the hell did you achieve that? I mean, and, I and what does that mean to you? good isn't it no seriously um like in australia i think like most western countries there is a um a very clear uh we call it gender pay gap i'm sure it's, it's called that in europe as well where um men on average and men doing the same job earn more than women um do and it's proven you know decade after decade and year after year now that we've got you know comprehensive stats anyway through the relentless implementation we've done looking at gender equity um, last year our gender pay uh, equity review showed that women were earning 7.8 percent more than men <laughs> which um, is amazing given that the Australians um, average is 14 percent less than men that's a 21 percent difference right that's a really big deal um, now that doesn't mean for the same job that I get paid 7.8 percent more than my male colleague it's organizational average what it actually shows is we've got more women in senior positions more women in uh -huh. management um, so although 60 percent of our workforce is male we have nearly 50 percent of um, females in management so it means that females are in the higher higher positions professionally um, and and that's look I don't know of anyone else in Australia who has that type of positive uh, pay uh -huh. gap I, I don't know of anyone so I, I think we're leading in that area which is great oh well it would love to it would be great to do some comparisons between other countries in Europe mm. let's do that that would be good mm. let's do that and find it would that be. out it would be and just for my ma just for the males out there, in case they're thinking, oh, gee, how can she be talking about equity when she's talking about women earning more than men? When we actually look at the same position, equal positions in the organisation, men are being paid 1.1% more than women. I would call that equal. So for the same yeah, work, yeah. equal, but um, earnings overall, women are in, in 
uh, higher positions than men. But the yeah. basic thing you've said is that women are in higher positions in general than you would find in the average. And that's obviously quite by a lot. Uh, more, a, a, by a lot more. Yeah. 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 I mean, how long? I mean, when did you start at Sydney? I mean, how long has this taken? Because we're talking about the long haul. It has been a long haul. It's been 10 years of work. Um and it's really been, um, I mean, we've done a lot of work, not just in this area. I mean, we're doing some, some really great work in terms of uh, cultural diversity at the moment as well. Um, but um, yeah, it has been a long haul. I remember, if I can just tell you one very small story about the, the first time I talked about gender um, uh. equity in our organisation. It was around a table with some of the, our union delegates and I was actually challenged on putting forward a women in leadership program on International Women's Day because um, it was discriminatory. And so <laughs> that's the sort of basis we were working on, whereas, you know, now we have a much more fulsome, um, complex, nuanced, you know, understanding so, so just looking at that 10 years, mm. when I mean, clearly there was a mountain to climb and all of this sort of thing. Mm. How many years did it take where you felt you were getting over the top and beginning to move forward in a way that just felt normal and natural, both for men and women, in a sense? How, how mm. long did that take to sort of spell itself out? I'd say about three to four. Really? Three to four years. Mm, yeah, yeah, the beginnings of that. And um, because I think that because we weren't just tackling gender equity and so, of course, we were tackling all sorts of equity issues. And so once the men realised this wasn't about disadvantaging men, in fact, equity was going to serve their benefit, you know, was going to benefit them as well, that actually there was something in it for everybody then, of course, people just went, OK, great, bring it on. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm really learning something from this conversation mm. with you, because <laughs> in, in a sense, that's why the fairness thing is such a good mm. uh, uh, focus, because, as you mm. said, who's getting the window seat sort of thing and so on. And mm. that could be mm. a guy or a woman or anyone. Um, mm. You also you also had some sort of quite unusual programs. Um, this one, uh, I think it was a neuroscience one, which was looking at unconscious bias and workplace mm -hmm. threats. Mm -hmm. what, what's mm -hmm. that about? That sounds unusual. Yeah, we've we've used a fair bit of neuroscience um, in terms of our leadership and our management um, training programs, and we've actually found of of all the programs that I've delivered, and I've delivered a lot, um, that has really got cut through, especially with um, middle managers and sort of supervisors. And yeah. basically, it's the idea that um, we're social beings, yeah, and um, that um, you know, rewards like pay and chocolate and stuff like that, that's great, material rewards, but there are also social rewards and social punishments, you know. So things like social status and belonging and fairness we've talked about are all really, really important as well. And that actually affect the way, you know, that we're able to think. So going back to what I said before, this, these states of positive emotion actually, you know, allow us to use our, you know, critical faculties to the best of their ability. And that drives, you know, good quality thinking, including creative thinking. Whereas if we perceive a threat, and if that's a social threat, that might be you disrespecting my social status, for example, um, yeah. then what that's going to trigger is more my sort of primitive brain. And I'm going to respond in sort of a fight and flight. And my, you know, top cortical thinking is just going to, you know, be sort of shut down. And it's been a really simple, effective way of getting people to understand how um, social threat, like, you know, disrespect um, and um, et cetera, is, is, is really a threat to creative thinking and problem solving. And if you want to get the best out of people, well, you better understand that.
Well, I, I really find it quite interesting. There you are. Mm. We're calling you a creative bureaucrat, but you're also <laughs> having to really be on top of the science at the same time, in mm. a way, partly, I suppose, to prove some mm. of the things you mm. want to achieve. Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, I think science really helps. And I also think the whole, um, the biology helps. I think when you can really ground people in the sense of their humanness, you know, whether that's, um, you know, comparing it to, um, I don't know, you know, other, other creatures, you know, who are also threatened and what they do. If you can connect people with their physicality of how they feel about something, somehow um, that knowledge gets embodied, you know, and people are able to uh -huh. act on something in a much more uh, grounded, you know, way uh -huh. than it just being some theoretical idea about um, leadership. Yeah, what, what I like so much about what you're talking about is there's a sort of an emotional intelligence that you're trying mm. to uh, either show, in a sense, you and your colleagues mm. and so on. And therefore, that psychological understanding seems to be incredibly mm. important of, of mm. what makes people behave in certain ways. Um, mm. now, now, that's impressive. Um, mm. But how many people have gone on those training programs like? 10 100 or whatever 500 yeah, yeah, about, uh, uh, about 300 which is most of our um managers so uh, yeah about 300 yeah uh -huh. um, i mean ha ha how many staff are there in total in the city of sydney just out of interest about two and a half thousand um direct yeah. um and then of course we you know have contractors and services that right. we, we outsource yeah yeah, but basically those 300 then filter down that, that, that ethos and, and those set of values that you're describing. I mean, just mm. on while we're on that uh, values and ethos, I mean, to make this happen, I mean, you had to have an environment, a nurturing environment yourself that someone said, go for it, Susan. We <laughs> like it. We love it. We like mm. it. Whatever they say. Mm. I mean, mm. is that true? I mean, did you have that nurturing environment? Partially. I have a fantastic CEO. You've met her, Charles, uh, yeah. Monica Baroni, who um, is yeah. really brilliant. And we work sort of, you know, hand in glove when it comes to this uh, organisational work. And she's brilliant. She just is so totally committed um, to the same sorts of principles and values that I am. And um, we also have an inspiring uh, Lord Mayor, Clover Moore. Um, so, so that that was a really great support, but I can't say it was a nurturing environment when I first got there. Honestly, I would describe it as a hostile environment because I was full of <laughs> I was full of you know all these ideas of of change and wanted to shake things up, you know. So I wouldn't describe it as as nurturing. I had nurturing aspects to it. Yeah. Oh, all right. I, I think I got that wrong. What I meant is, <laughs> let's say Monica and Clover nurtured you a bit or gave you yeah, some sustenance. Yeah. Is perhaps, absolutely. Is perhaps... Absolutely. And I was inspired by that. And um, that's what I wanted to do. And one of the big things was I was so inspired by the external facing vision because yeah. the City of Sydney, you know, if there's two principles we really stand by, it's environmental sustainability, doing good by the uh -huh. planet. Um, and the second is social justice, yeah. And yeah. so they're values that I hold, you know, very, yeah. very dearly as and well. And I wanted to make the inside look like the outside. That was my job, right? Oh, that's um, great. So, yeah. No, I love that um, phrase. I wanted to make the inside look like the, <laughs> the, 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 the outside. No, I can I can yeah. see that because they're a set of sort of key anchoring principles that guide action. I, I mean, that 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 I can feel. I mean, just yeah. while we're talking about inspiration, I mean, I know you've worked in many other big organizations as well, but and you've looked mm. around the world. I mean, mm. just uh, over look doing that sort of overview of around the world. I mean, are there other organizations that have inspired you along the way or individuals or mm. I don't know, mm. thinkers or whatever? Is there anyone mm. there worth mentioning? 
Uh, I have worked for some great organisations. I've worked for some great uh, health organisations, which I've really loved. But look, there's a recent experience I was involved in at the beginning of this year and last year that's really inspired me. And that's been the Women for Climate uh, Change uh-huh. program. And um, so it's a C40 initiative uh, and Women for Climate uh, is a is a I guess a sub organization that's about trying to develop future women leaders who can take action on climate change. And I've been, um, I was responsible for the Sydney program. I put my hand up uh-huh. and um, I've just been working with 20 amazing younger women who are all really passionate about taking action on climate change. And also we've uh-huh. matched them to 20 amazing you know, um, senior women to mentor them. And we've had this year long program and that's really reinvigorated me actually, just the whole sort of seeing the whole energy and drive, you know, in terms of um, passion for turning your own um, talents, I guess, into to public good. It's, it's been fantastic. It's a great program. And they're around the world. There's one in Paris. There's one in London. Um, there's one in Tel Aviv. There's one in, yeah, um, yeah Canada yeah, it's somewhere. Interesting. I've forgotten the city. Yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, one thing I have to say, uh, you, you taught me something which really opened my eyes. I remember having a drink with you and you reminded me, not reminded me, told me there's this thing called the discretionary effort. And that suddenly opened my eyes. Of course, if you've got a system that is a bit toxic or a tiny bit toxic, you, you just say it's five o'clock. See you later. I've got something else to do. Whereas if you've got let's use the word nurturing again, Mm. that nurturing environment, you say, sure, I'll help you. What can I do? I'll stay till six. Mm. I'll work it out. Mm. And Mm. that is so much about what our overall project is about, is creating environments where the sort of things you're talking about uh, uh, happen. Just another Mm. question, it may be the final one, I don't know, because I could talk Mm. to you for quite a long time, (laughs) is... um, I mean, in a sense, there is this long haul. After three years, you felt that the big bumps Mm. had been got Mm. over. You've been doing stuff that's going ever more in detail. I'm sure this neuroscience, you're learning along the way Mm. and so on. I mean, how far do you think you've got or how far do you think Mm. you need to go? Or what are the next big questions one has to to look at? Mm. Because I think the audience would really like to know that. I th- I think we've come a long way. I'm really really proud of what we've achieved together. And um, when I compare it, you know, um, externally, whether we benchmark what we're doing, we come up really well. I'm very proud of that. But of course, questions a bit like how long's a piece of string? <laughs> we could improve. You know, we're still a long way to improve. Um, uh-huh. Look, what I've been thinking about, Charles, and I'm sure you have too is how this all this strange remoteness is going to impact on all these principles and constructs we're talking about. Um, Uh Because, you know, I come back to this thing about we are human, you know, we are human animals, you know, and we have this, um, we we don't just have two senses looking at the video camera and talking, you know, we have many other senses um, as well. We can pick up on the mood and the energy of people. We can read things into, you know, there's a whole lot of things that we pick up by being in proximity with people. And we know that creativity you know, often comes out of the rub between people in proximity and the incidental experiences. So the question going through my head is, how are we going to sustain all that? How are we going to sustain that sense of belonging and meaning and creativity if social um, proximity is really compromised? That's the big question for me. Yeah, and and is is uh, I know it's easy to ask. Is there mm. anything you're thinking through? Because I mean, I know that you, you know, human touch, mm. an occasion, occasional hug, whatever it is, mm. Mm. All, all of these things are just what makes life what it is. Um, mm. 
you're leaving us with a real problem there. I think this is something that, <laughs> that I think we've really got to collectively think that through because I think we that do. sometimes when you're in these big uh, virtual meetings, you sort mm -hmm. of feel, uh, uh, I feel like occasionally touching the computer in order to touch mm -hmm. the person at the other end mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. it doesn't quite work. Yeah. Um, but so, so this then unfortunately says we've got another long haul <laughs> which is somehow uh, 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 addressing that. Anyway, I think so. uh, but to but to yeah. recognise it is the first step, you know, to really recognise that, that what I'm telling my organisation is, you know, because we've adapted quite well, but we, I've sort of the language we're using is um, the reason we can collaborate so well is because it's built on the social capital that we've built over all this time. We can't take this for granted, right? You've got to still keep putting back in the piggy bank, right? Chopping up the social capital yeah. to allow yeah. this level of collaboration and work to work. And I don't know that it's very effective. We, I don't know how much we're putting back in the piggy bank during this time. Yeah, I think that's really important that you raise the, the, the point of social capital, because in a sense, mm. that's your resource that you've created. There's obviously mm. financial capital, but with social capital, the more you bring in, the more you get mm. in, 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 a, in a sense. Well, Susan, there we are. I think uh, we'll leave it as we must grow social capital is perhaps one of our final comments. And it's fantastic to hear you from Sydney. Um, and there you are. So I think I'm going to send you a virtual hug <laughs> in some <Okay>. form. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. It's always really inspiring and lovely to talk to you. Thanks a lot. And see you soon, hopefully, face to face. Yeah, I hope Bye. to see you soon. Bye. Bye.